Hey, hi everybody. Um, so it's been a while since I sent you guys um, a new message and uh, for some of you in BIS 202, um, since I finished my lecture recordings quite a bit earlier, um, there haven't been any new messages for me since for about a week or so. So I thought I'd just check in and uh, let you know how things are going for me uh, and my family and also um, share a bit of the news I've been hearing on CBC Radio um, and also hopefully just get, get me reach out to, to, to connect and uh, hopefully make you guys feel more comfortable and connected with me and with each other um, and um, yeah and just give some tips for a healthy kind of sane living <laughs> in these kind of crazy times. Um, so a few things uh, one is like all the efforts you guys have been doing to self-isolate and to um, to practice good hand hygiene and that kind of thing has been working um, so um, from CBC News, from, from hearing from all the different doctors involved in monitoring the COVID-19 outbreak, it sounds as though things are cautiously optimistic um, that we're pretty surely not going to be in the same situation as Italy. So for those who are, if you hear any few mongers saying that, that things can, can get that bad, it's pretty unlikely for us right now. Just to give you some examples, um, because, I mean, if you think about how quickly things have kind of deteriorated in some cities and countries, like our spread is relatively slow and controlled. And because of, if you just think about the last few weeks, how it's been a relatively slow increase considering we're in the exponential part of the curve, um, it's given our health system and our country a lot of time to repair things. I mean, for example, in BC, um, we went from pretty close to 100% capacity in the hospitals, which makes sense if it's an efficient hospital system, it shouldn't be empty most of the time. Um, but they've taken a lot of steps to clear hospital beds, hospital beds has, uh, such that there's 400 beds empty and waiting and ready for um, the, the, the surge in, in, in help that uh, we expect people to need. Um, I heard today that they're just uh, starting um, that I just heard today that they're starting to use the Vancouver Convention Center, which is if you haven't been there, a humongous building in order to set up uh, places for people without COVID-19 uh, to be able to receive medical treatment and care. Um, so that they can isolate um, the, the two populations so they're not spreading it between the two vulnerable populations. Um, so these are things that we wouldn't have time, have had time to do, um, that we wouldn't have this capacity waiting, ready and waiting had, had we not taken all these kind of very, what seemed like extreme at first efforts to, to self-isolate and to uh, practice physical distancing and, and, and good ha uh, hygiene. Um, so definitely, again, pat yourselves on the back, like the sacrifices that you've made both financially and socially and um, academically um, in these last few weeks has made a huge difference to our entire country in terms of the people um, getting uh, sick and being able to get help that they need. Um, also, um, yeah, it's also kind of cool hearing today about how different companies in Canada are working to um, build uh, respirators and uh, masks and all kinds of other things that uh, people need in the front lines, not just in Canada, but across the world as well. So that seems like a really great way to create jobs and to um, really help people um, um, supply what, what the medical professionals need in order to, to um, do their jobs. Um, it's also really cool to hear all the stories of people uh, at seven o'clock every day banging your pots and pans and cheering and playing bagpipes and singing in order to to cheer on those frontline workers that are really just overworking themselves doing everything they can to take care of the people uh, who need help. So there's a lot of positive stories out there. I'm, I'm hoping that more and more people are sharing and spending time watching those positive stories and seeing how a crisis can bring out the best in people and spending less time with what Facebook news and um, the internet likes to throw at you, which is the doom and gloom, panicky stuff that that really isn't helpful and isn't isn't good for anybody right now. So uh, I encourage you to, to share share the good share the good news, share real news, share share the truth with each other, um, in order to um, uh, help each other see this realistically and also positively um, during these tougher times. Um, so a couple of things that were interesting that I've learned in this past week. So as I said before, my routine has been to listen to CBC radio in the morning. So that's 88.1 88 FM. Um, and because every morning at about 8.15 AM, including weekends, every single morning, the prime minister speaks on the radio, uh, updating the things that they're doing to help take care of everybody and where things are at. Um, and then there's kind of good commentators before and after that, including uh, Brian Goldman from White Coat Black Garden CBC, who helps to explain from the medical point of view as an emergency doctor um, how things are going and, and how he sees things from the medical side. 
Um, so really great coverage there. And that's my main source of news. And I listen to that every morning uh, while I'm um, driving my wife to work and then coming back, making breakfast, that kind of thing. Um, and then I basically tune out and focus on recording lectures and stuff like that for the rest of the day. And I found that routine has helped me stay well informed and getting balanced kind of um, clear coverage with, you know, Prime Minister being challenged by, by the hard questions that we're all asking as well. Um, and then I'm not wasting too much time and energy and stress um, listening to every kind of crazy bit of news out there that might not be quite as reliable. Uh, so I suggest that you do something similar that uh, whether you like to listen to the radio or read up on the news, read a credible news source to get updated. Uh, I'd suggest just once in the morning or evening, or probably morning better because then you're not stressed out in the evening. And then spend the rest of the day just taking care of yourself and each other and, and what you need to do there. Um, another interesting program I heard, um, so, so all that news I gave earlier about what's happening with the hospital beds and stuff like that is just from CBC. Um, there's another program that I listen to a lot called Quirks and Quarks. If you have time, if you're uh, taking breaks later on, I suggest you check it out because there's been really good news and um, kind of scientific coverage of uh, COVID-19, but it's also just a cool kind of um, uh, podcast and radio show that covers um, all kinds of science news and it keeps you really up to date on cutting edge news, uh, new discoveries and just weird funky things in, in nature so um, definitely worth checking out but there was um, if you check out the podcast that was posted it's online right now you can download it um, from CBC uh, quirks and uh, CBC if you look up CBC quirks and quirks it's the March 28th show which just happened to be playing last night when I was going to take out the garbage and they were talking to an epidemiologist um, from U of T um, who's been uh, using the information from all, all across the world uh, about the COVID-19 outbreak and trying to model um, what the, uh, so I should, I should call it pandemic, not a break. I think that's the more proper terminology. Um, looking at how the pandemic is going to look over the next two years or so. Um, two years because, I mean, in, in a conservative estimate, that might be how long it takes to get any, uh, get a vaccine out. And at that point, if there's vaccinations available, we'd be able to make pretty much everybody immune quite quickly. And then like that will change the way things are very much, but she wanted to know what's going to happen between now and when the vaccine's available. Of course, everybody's working on the vaccine super fast, so that'll get there maybe hopefully sooner than uh, sooner than two years. But that's a very conservative, let's look farther just in case kind of situation. And it was kind of interesting because she said that from her best estimates, from all the information that she's gathered around the world and, and specifically what's, what, applying that to what's happening in Canada, she expects that the kind of um, number of people infected is going to go kind of up and down like a wave, which is why this podcast on Quirks and Quirks CBC, um, one of the topics is called Riding the Wave. So we flattening the curve right now is just so that we can prepare everything so that whenever the peak comes up, it doesn't come up too quickly so that anybody who needs treatment that would follow um, would be able to be treated in that we stay below that line of what the medical um, community can handle. Um, so we've been doing a great job of that. We get to keep that up. But what she believes is that um, as that peak comes and goes, this initial peak, um, and as testing starts to get more um more widespread beyond the clusters that they're trying to focus on and isolate um, we'll be able to kind of be more sure of how safe things are in a community and then start to loosen some of the measures that we've been doing right now right so people can see their families and girlfriends and boyfriends and, and that kind of thing and, and um, kind of restart society a little bit with you know some care in terms of uh, physical distancing and uh, managing of little clusters of uh, outbreaks here and there as somebody comes back from a cruise ship or another country and maybe there's a little bit of spread and then they take care of everybody there and then that that'll make a little peak and come back down so um, over these two years it's not going to be like we're going to be locked down for months and like I said hopefully the the immune uh, the vaccine will be ready a lot sooner than that but because um, if some people think oh I'm not going to see my I'm not gonna be able to hug my my boyfriend or girlfriend or whatever for um for months and months and it, that's like a really scary thing so know that there, there should be according to this epidemiologist a kind of ebb and flow that things will get kind of better and will loosen things up and people can kind of get back to some percentage of everyday life people can go back to school that kind of thing perhaps and go back to work and and keep good distance and good habits from there and then if there's a bit of a surge then we just say okay everybody tighten up again work from home for a few weeks bring it back down and then as things get better and all the clusters are kind of dampened down and taken care of and people become immune again and come back up so that's, I think, I mean, that's one epidemiologist's kind of professional opinion of what might happen. But it's just interesting to hear that kind of um, somewhat realistic um, prediction of how life might look for the next uh, next while. Um, and as I said, once immunizations are available, then 
um, we can just make everybody safely immune and and life can get a lot more back to normal but along the way it doesn't have to be quite as extreme it is like like uh, as extreme as it is right now um, for long term according to this epidemiologist so that was interesting um, also right after that they uh, interviewed um, Peter Unrau, who is a professor here at SFU, uh, and his postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Lina Dolgoshina, um, they have been working with an RNA assay that they call RNA mango because it's really brightly colored. Um, and they found a way to use the RNA mango kind of um, procedure that they have and the, and the technique and tools that they have in order to do another very sensitive blood test for um, COVID-19. So that's yet another tool that can help with that kind of testing that would allow us to know how safe the community is, identify and isolate and take care of the clusters and let the rest of society kind of get a bit more back to normal with, with social distancing and some amount of uh, care. So there's a lot of things moving forward that, that can bring us back towards some more normal life um, you know, in, in, in the foreseeable future, right? So know that as much as we don't know, nobody can give an exact date of when everything's gonna be back to normal completely, the prediction is that there will be kind of different levels of normal that wave back and forth over the next while. And then eventually when the vaccine's available, then kind of back to being normal everyday life and go have sushi with 15 friends again. <laughs> All right. Um, uh, another interesting thing I heard this morning after the, the prime minister address and the, and the questioning period after that was they went back to our regular local programming and they were talking to um, some, I think, clinical psychologists or psychologists about kind of the toll it can take for people to be um, stressed long term. If people always feel like, oh my goodness, I'm, I'm, I'm in danger of getting this. Oh, sorry, one more thing about the epidemiologist. She was saying that with that wave up and down uh, over two years up until the vaccine's available or hopefully way sooner than that, um, if we do manage it in that way, if people listen to um, what the government says and isolate when they're supposed to and are careful in how they socialize when it, when things are loosened up then the total percentage of people she that her models predict will be infected during those years before the vaccine is available is about five percent so that's that's not bad like across two uh, like across um two years hopefully max of um you know, new, new little clusters of outbreaks happening all across the country uh, added up across the entire two years. If only 5% of our population gets sick um, and hopefully we're able to protect our older population uh, better and more completely um, later in these two years, um, then that, that's saving a heck of a lot of lives because she said that if we did nothing at all, if we weren't doing what we're doing right now, that number would be about 50%, right? So 45% of our Canadian population is being saved by what we're doing right now. By her estimation which is like makes me want to tear up because like they're not kidding when they say that what we do individually right now can affect the whole country right five percent if we're listening carefully and following riding that curve and, and being being careful when we're supposed to be careful we'll basically save 45 percent of the population from being infected and suffering from the, the disease and you know a small percentage of those that that may have died wouldn't because they weren't exposed at all so um, again, thank you guys and pat yourselves on the back for all that you're doing and all the sacrifices you're making in order to help to flatten the curve because it's going to make a huge difference in the very close future um, in how this outbreak plays out and how many people get sick and how people get treatment by, by us following um, people's uh, the, the medical guidelines. So that, yeah, that was really interesting to hear those numbers and those predictions. Um, yeah, so back to the, the mental health thing. So uh, those of you in 101, I'll be posting um, the last top, topic four for the lectures, which talks about how our bodies handle stress. I have a kind of sillier example that's quite fun to go through and we'll go through that together. But then um, later on in that, we talk about, we will talk about long-term stress and how that affects your um, um, cortisol levels, the, a, a stress hormone that you keep in the background when you're kind of slightly in danger, but not in an immediate danger, and how that kind of is not great for your overall physical health if your body is always preparing for panic or immediate danger um, so that cut it's kind of interesting that when you watch that lecture uh, I'll pause and talk about how this kind of applies to our current situation for those of you in 202 um, maybe I'll send you that link to in case you're curious you can watch um, the 101 uh, topic 4 lecture if you like and fast forward to the stress um, 
portion of it. I'll, I'll put it in the comments what portion to, to, to fast forward to. Um, but generally speak, to, to speak in general terms, um, if, you're, if, if your habits every day lately has been causing you stress, if you feel as though you're quite anxious and stressed out and having trouble sleeping um, and feeling like you're just on edge all the time, um, that's not a great thing for your physical and mental health in general. Um, just because the body does get um, worn out, right? Um, uh, the, the, the scientist who was talking this morning was calling it weathering. That generally speaking, when you're calm and relaxed, you take care of your body. Your body takes care of itself. Just like when you're calm and relaxed, when there's a leak in the roof, you go fix that. If there's some condensation in the window, you replace it. You'll take care of the house. But when you're stressed out and kind of locked on lockdown and watching out for danger and thinking that you need to run away from a bear anytime because it's in the in the mall with you, kind of thing. That's my very common uh, nightmare. Actually, is that there's a monster in the mall with me. I don't know why. I don't even go to the mall that much. Um, then what happens is you leave the leak in the roof, you leave the condensation window and things just start to weather and get less taken care of and, and it starts to not fall apart, but at least just not be in its best condition. So um, I really want you guys to take the steps. So if you are feeling anxious, if you are feeling stressed out, if you're having trouble sleeping, to take some steps to change what you're doing day by day and find ways to make um, your everyday life healthier and happier because that in the long term is good for your mental health but also for your physical health as well um, to be able to relax so I mentioned last time with my message that um, once you're home have you washed your hands um, and maybe change your clothes if you're worried that someone sneezed on you when you're at the uh, supermarket um, and take a shower then 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 you're safe right and know that you're safe and know that um, you're not that there's a person who said you're not you're not stuck at home you're you're stuck you're, you're, you're staying safe, you're in a safe environment. So when you're home, it's, it's important one to just know that you're safe and not worry about your own physical well-being because you're being as safe as you can possibly be. You're essentially in a wood and glass bubble that protects you from any infection. Um, but beyond that, it's also important to not read news that makes you panicky because most if there's any news out there that's making you panicky, it's not the right news. It's not news that is balanced and thoughtful coverage of the real real situation. Um, that kind of news gets a lot of um, forwards on social media, that kind of thing, because people get like worried and excited and they send it to all the relatives saying, there's a huge danger here, everybody watch out, because they feel like they're doing something good and protecting their, their friends and family when all they're really doing is spreading panic. So I think it's fair to talk to people who keep sending those messages on Facebook um, to, to stop, right? To, to think about what they're doing when they're sending this out. Are they doing any good? Are people learning anything useful from this? Is this even real? Like double fact check and see if it's even real first, right? And just in general, limit your looking to, to credible sources, limit the amount of time you spend looking at it. I'd say at this point to like half an hour, 20 minutes per day. Um, cause before I said, you know, spend an hour catching up and then do your own thing. At this point, things have slowed down. Things are not as crazy, um, in terms of, what's changing day by day with the news. So I think like a 20 minute update, listen to the first 10 minutes of any CBC radio, uh, of uh, any hour of CBC radio and just get caught up there and then just put it aside and get on with your everyday life. I think that'd be a lot better for your everyday health. And if you just do that, just have that um, um, news hygiene, right? And get rid of all that toxic panic uh, driving, like crazy news stuff that makes everybody panic and just Clean that out of your system. Clean that out of your house. Don't let it into your computer. Don't look at Facebook if everybody else is posting this garbage, right? And just get the real news, put it aside, and get on with life. And things will be, you'll find yourself a lot more relaxed just because people aren't trying to panic you and get attention all the time. It's, it's, it kind of sickens me that people keep forwarding things that are untrue just to scare everybody else and, and get attention when when that's just causing harm, right? So please do what you can to, to, to lower the stress levels um, in yourselves so in terms of ways to do that um, I've experienced some myself in that for example this past weekend a really good friend of mine Carmen uh, gave me a call because uh, her and her husband and her two cute little girls they've been um, <clears throat> having a habit of every dinner time they'll call a different uh, friend or family member to chat with them for the first little bit of dinner just to check in so they're rotating phone calls I was third on the list I was pretty pretty happy about that because I do see her as my sister my big sister and so we chatted for a while and, and, and it was just a regular little chat, but I actually felt a little choked up because it's, it was just, it was just so good to hear her voice. 
right? As mentioned before, talking to someone on the phone is like getting a hug from that person in terms of your oxytocin release and feeling of bonding and connectedness. And I felt hugged. I felt like I got a hug that I really, really needed. I didn't even realize it. I've been, I've been happy at home with my wife and my kids and, and feeling uh, like I've been a useful person during this time. But just hearing her voice just made me feel, oh, I, I needed that. Right. So if you have the time, if you're taking a break from studying, be that person for someone else. Right. Call your brother, your sister, call your parents and just work down the list from your family to your closest friends, to your less close friends, call your high school acquaintances. Right. And just one at a time, give that kind of vocal hug to someone else, because even to someone who feels like they're doing great, I, I didn't realize I needed it as much as I did. Right. So please do that for each other. Um, <clears throat> other things like my wife uh, had a meeting with her friends and their kids uh, just uh, over the iPad with uh, with Zoom. So I will try to get Zoom set up for us to meet with me with me for me to meet with you guys soon. Um, but that's a good way to get together with others as well. My friends also tried this party time or party something app um, where they can meet up and even play board games and stuff like that. So uh, I missed out on that, but we'll try again soon and try playing some sort of like vocal board game called psych so my friend jen uh, suggested that so we'll try that soon so there's good ways to meet each other that way um but an interesting thing so this morning there happened to be a, a psychologist talking about one one, uh, one of them was talking about the physiolog physiological problems with with stress over a long term and how it can be bad for your immune system and for me like when i'm stressed and not sleeping enough my my eczema acts up and my skin gets really dry and cracked right so there are physical tolls with being stressed all the time which is why it's so important for you to have good habits um but the other side there's another person who is talking about in terms of our psychology um these like i said phone calls and stuff are great and that does have that kind of hug like effect but then for those trying to stay connected with people um some more than others that these online technologies, phones, video conferencing, stuff like that, is missing a bit of that personal touch. I mean, if you're living on your own, you're probably dying for a hug right now, and and I feel for you, right? Um, and 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 this researcher did as well, just because it is really hard for us as social creatures to be physically isolated. But they had a good tip. So he's done research into um, um, what's missing in video conferencing type interactions um, and how to overcome that. So as much as video conferencing is not the same as physically being with someone, like they've, they've done research showing, like this is a lab that fo focuses on research into the connectedness of people, of how holding someone's hand or giving giving a hug makes them more resilient to stress, uh, more resilient to even physical pain uh, or annoyances. Uh, electrical shock actually is what they use, that if you're holding someone's hand, your, your ability to, to handle even something as painful as electrical shock goes, goes way up, you can handle more. So how do we give that to each other electronically when biologically it, it, there's a bit of a disconnect there um, in terms of the lack of physical touch and uh, what they said was it um, a way to overcome that electronic barrier is by showing um, is by sharing intimacy and I don't mean physical intimacy I mean um, being vulnerable with each other right that when you're talking to your family um, rather than just saying talking about how much toilet paper you have or don't have and that kind of thing um, Talk to about things that are vulnerable, that are happy or that are sad. Tell them about the tough things you're dealing with. Um, uh, or even try, try to dig a little deeper and get to know your parents better during this time or your family be friends better this time. Ask them, ask them questions like, you know, what was another hard time you've gone through? Um, or, you know, tell me what it was like when you were going through this tough thing because, you know, I'm going through a tough thing. It might help me, right? And in sharing these meaningful stories with each other to make these conversations not just about the surface of what's going on right now, but digging deeper into what's going on with yourself and others, that makes these electronic connections way more meaningful and way more satisfying for what our body needs right now. Um, for in terms of feeling like we're connected in an intimate and real way with someone even though we're physically uh, isol uh, phys physically distancing that social connection is something that's that's meaningful and, and 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 powerful so keep that in mind right so one um, call out to people talk to them let them hear your voice and see your face and have that comfort that that you know almost brought tears in my eyes even though i'm, I'm feeling pretty pretty solid i thought Right, so be that for even the strong people in your life, and just make a habit of it. Every dinner time, call someone new and chat with them while you're eating, and share in your food, and uh, and and share of yourself. Right, the more vulnerable you can be with them, the more they're gonna get out of that connection, out of that call. Um, 
So along those lines, uh, in terms of vulnerability and, and social connectedness, there's one other story that I heard very early on, like the very first day that I was um, uh, isolating myself at home, partly because I had that cough and cold type thing, so completely quarantining myself, but also, you know, first few days of being at home as well. Um, I heard the story on CBC as well um, about this uh, just little small kind of nonprofit y organization called Choir, 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 like the singing choir, C-H-O-I-R. Um, that usually meets up in different restaurants and bars and stuff like that uh, once a week on Tuesdays to um, get together and sing and uh, basically form a little impromptu cry choir, learn a song together and sing it together and they record it and put it online to share with everybody else. And um, since they couldn't do that in person, they started running it just electronically with others and it exploded worldwide and people were singing together worldwide. So, in, so inspired by that and also inspired by the idea that by being vulnerable with each other, um, that, that that can increase that social connectedness and that well-being and that stress relief that we really need. I'm going to try to completely embarrass myself by singing with you. <laughs> so I'm going to start my own little choir, choir, choir with my own students right now. As I wet my voice. So what I thought was, I'm going to take one of the songs that Choir, Choir, Choir sang as their first online thing as a way to, because they, they tend to pick songs that are, you know, of the moment. And so one song that they sang was Stand By Me, because it, it makes sense that right now, we're, even though we physically are, are, are distancing, uh, socially we want to stand by each other. Um, so I will start the music first. I'm going to play it on my phone because I'm hoping that by having a bad quality music sound that YouTube isn't going to block the sound from this video when I post it. Um, yeah, and also uh, I remember there's this workshop I did back in the day for uh, teaching practices that says you gotta strike that right balance between being approachable and friendly and not scary to students and appearing professional enough that they trust that when you say, oops, sorry, that they trust what you say is actually, you actually know what you're talking about. So I'm hoping since we're near the end of the semester, that you trust that I am a respectable and professional teacher, one who cares first and foremost for your learning and for your growth as students, um, such that my reputation to you guys and my image to you guys as a credible teacher is not too damaged by the silliness that's about to ensue and the embarrassment that's gonna come from someone who hates his own voice and doesn't like singing, uh, shares and joins you guys in song, you guys in the song. All right, so I'm gonna play the song and uh, I'll put up the lyrics after the fact on uh, on the screen. So feel please feel free to join me and, and sing sing along and and just um, laugh at me being a having a horrible voice and and being stupid um, <laughs> as a way of me being vulnerable to you guys. And I, I also hope that by being uh, em being embarrassing and stupid, that you feel safe enough having this ammunition on me. Um, to, to call me if you need something. So if you're feeling vulnerable and anxious and can't sleep, if you, found, if you find that you are one of those people who just having trouble sleeping and stressed out all the time and panicky, I've, that, that you will call this, this goofball and, and just chat with me about it and, and we can try to find ways to, like I can try to help you find ways to, to lighten your load and to brighten your life and to... Um, and to find that balance where you're informed and you feel like you had, know everything you need to know to be safe and can continue with your life in a healthy way. So I really want to help you with that. So, um, so do call me if you're having trouble rearranging your life to be less stressful, less anxious and more healthy because that's something I want all of you to do right away today. If you can, like rearrange your daily routine to get away from the new, that bad news and focus on productive uh, happy healthy things um, so like I said I am sacrificing my reputation as a person teacher singer parent human being um, such that I become on the scale of being approachable and someone you can talk to as much as possible so please take advantage of this vulnerability and call me and uh, we'll try to find ways to help everybody all, all 300 of you um, feel supported and safe and not anxious and can move forward positively as we ride this wave towards you know back to a normal and maybe even better life now that we've all learned from each other and joined together all right so with all that rambling in mind 
hopefully you can still respect me after this um but please do sing along invite your friends to come along by zoom and sing along as well uh, maybe we'll start our own sfu biology 101 202 joint choir all right i was actually in choir back in high school because i'm that cool um but thankfully i didn't have to sing much because my voice is flat plain and boring uh and they mainly wanted me to play the piano which i did lots so that worked out well but here we go night has come and the land is dark and the moon is the only light we'll see no i won't be afraid no i won't be afraid just as long as you stand stand by me so darling darling stand by me oh stand by me oh stand stand by me stand by me if the sky that we look upon should tumble and fall and the mountains should crumble to the sea i won't cry i won't cry no i won't shed a tear just as long as you stand stand by me so darling darling stand by me oh stand by me oh stand stand by me stand by me I assure you I've not been drinking or doing illicit drugs. I just didn't know what to do with this musical interlude, so I thought I'd buy some toys to play along with. Stand by me, oh stand by me, oh stand by me, stand by me. Whenever you're in trouble, won't you stand by me? Whoa, stand by me. I want to order one of these to hug too. It's kind of nice to have something to hug. Anyways, um, that's it for this particular message. Uh, so hopefully this was helpful in some way and not too cringeworthy and traumatizing. But like I said, I just wanted to knock myself down a peg or 15 and hopefully make myself more approachable to you guys because um there have been some people called with with worries and i've been uh, like happy to talk and, and try to help out and i just want all of you to feel comfortable um reaching out if you if you if you want to talk and and just even in talking in practical senses if you want to figure out how you can kind of plan for your final exam studying to be efficient and productive um while also figuring out a daily routine that keeps you away from um too much panic and worry and stress um, let's work on that together. It's both an academic and a social psychological exercise to, to hopefully make every day more productive and easier from now on uh, if we work together at it. So please do give me a call if there's anything I can help with. Uh, again, the offer still stands. If you if you need any supplies or, or food and, and you're stuck at home without a car or, or having to self-isolate, uh, self please do give me a call and I'd be happy to come help. All right, thank you very much for taking the time to watch, watch this really rambly, convoluted message. But uh, I've heard from some of you that it's helpful, so I thought I'd just send another one uh, since it's been a little while. All right, take care of yourselves, everybody. Uh, hopefully I'll hear from you soon. Um, otherwise, um, um, I'll be in touch uh, fairly soon with um, more final details on your final exams and that kind of thing, um, which we'll prepare for together. All right, thanks, everybody. Um, good to talk to you all, and uh, hopefully I will see you all soon, uh, sooner rather than later in person back on campus. All right, bye, everyone.